the day of Pentecost. This great day has always been one of my very favorite celebrations of the Christian year. This is the feast day of the Holy Spirit, the proclamation that God himself fills and empowers the church in this very day and time. And yet, how sad it has been to me that for much of my life, my experience of this day in the church's worship has been that almost nothing special happens on the day of Pentecost as compared to, say, Christmas or Easter or even All Saints Day. Nothing really special happens. In so many places, it seems to be virtually overlooked. At least it is seriously underplayed. There are more places than I care to imagine where it seems that the only thing that actually happens that is really different on this Sunday is that they change the color of the hangings and the vestments to red, as if by itself this means that something special is going on. And one of the reasons for this comparative neglect, I suspect, is the notion that the Holy Spirit is somehow the stuff of religious fanaticism, of TV faith healers, emotionally overwrought televangelists, and the like. And we Episcopalians want to stay away from all of that, preferring a religious piety that is more orderly and, well, controlled. Really, though, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit doesn't have to be anything like such fanaticism. This great feast day first of all proclaims that the Holy Spirit is given to the church. Again, the Holy Spirit created the church. So it is that the day of Pentecost is often referred to as the birthday of the church. And I would argue that the Spirit's presence in the church is, to begin with, steady, comforting, and reassuring before it is in any way disorienting. I mean, Jesus himself calls the Holy Spirit the Comforter. But this steadying comfort certainly doesn't mean that the church is merely earthbound. And when you really think about it, when you really think about it, if this wondrous day says anything, it says that the church is supernatural. Yes, the church. Supernatural. This often frustrating, sometimes apparently graceless institution is in fact supernatural. Now, many may be suspicious of this assertion, and some may well deny it and argue against it all day long, but I say the scriptures are very clear on this point, and it is a cause for celebration. The church is a supernatural reality. And yes, to be sure, 
we must be reminded of this quite often. After all, so much of our experience, what we see and what we receive from the church, seems to be anything but supernatural, right? I mean, we see budgets, and we see he committee meetings, and we hear about all sorts of dispiriting things going on, and so the church starts to look and act like everything else in the world. But even so, the church, in spite of it all, and beyond it all, remains a phenomenon that quite surpasses anything and everything in human life. We are reminded of this on feast days like Pentecost. Indeed, we should be reminded of this every single Sunday in our worship. The church is birthed from the supernatural. That's what all of the trimmings and trappings are all about, the vestments and the ceremonial and the adornments. It's all supposed to remind us of the supernatural origins and, all, and the ongoing reality of the supernatural church. It all comes out of the reading we just had from the book of Acts, where the tongues of flame descended on the heads of the disciples. But if that's true, if the church is supernatural, if that's true, it means that you cannot be in relationship to the church the way that you are in relationship to every other institution in your life. Because of the fact that the church is something supernatural, you will not be in relationship to your church the way that you are in relationship to a business, the government, a charity, or whatever. It must be different. It will be different if you take the origins of the church seriously. We know that the church is supernatural because it is the church's privilege, as we again heard in the book, read from the book of Acts, it is the church's privilege to be the recipient, the recipient of the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the unique property, unique property and responsibility of the church to be the earthly home of God. Now many may be suspicious of this assertion. Some might well deny it and argue against it all day long, but I say that the scriptures are very clear on this point, and it is a cause for celebration. The church is the home of God in this mortal world. We know this because in another part of John's Gospel than what we have read today, in another part of John's Gospel that describes the gift of the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself gathers his disciples around him and he says to them, Receive. Receive the Holy Spirit. And then he adds, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now if that doesn't make your skin tingle, then you're not listening. It is the church's power and responsibility and authority, yes, there's that dreaded word, authority, here in this age of individualism, <laughs> authority. In a time when we don't want to give authority to anything outside of our own arenas of heart and home and work and life, the 
the church has the authority to forgive and retain sins. Jesus says so. Now, for some, this may conjure up images of what is commonly known as confession. And in fact, that is involved here, both public confession during worship, Sunday by Sunday, and private confession with the priest, if you wish. But before all of that, before all of that, in the early church, the language of forgiving and retaining sins was baptism language. Baptism language. The primary reference in the early church for the forgiveness of sin was baptism. And so when we speak of the church's power to forgive and retain sin, we're actually speaking about the church's power to bestow baptism. The church is therefore the channel, the channel through which the Holy Spirit is given to a human life. Now make no mistake about it. At your baptismal font, something supernatural happens to all those who are brought there and baptized. Something supernatural happens. They are changed. They are changed. We are changed through our baptism. Changed forever, for eternity. By the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And we are divinely strengthened by that same Spirit through confirmation, reception, as we will have today. But here we come to another of the great messages of this day of Pentecost. The way. The Holy Spirit works in human life is fundamentally communal, not individual. Fundamentally communal. I think we hear far too much emphasis, perhaps we ourselves place far too much emphasis on individualism with respect to the gift of the Holy Spirit. The essential reality of the gift and presence of the Holy Spirit is in and through the gathered community, not in individual experience. But the effect of baptism, the effect of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the grace of confirmation and reception, is indeed personal. Oh yes, it's highly personal. Not merely individual, but absolutely personal. We must know, all of us must know, that Christianity itself must always be personal, but it is never individual. Christianity is never individual. Now, this is certainly not to diminish or supersede an individual's worth or unique significance, but rather to become something even more, even more. And that is to become part of the communion of saints. Now I get to meddle. You know, your life is not just your business. Contrary to what culture tries to sell us all the time. In Christian faith, your life is not simply your own business. Now, many may be suspicious of this assertion. And some might well deny it and argue against it all day long, but I say the scriptures are very clear on this point, and it is a cause for celebration. Your life is not simply about you alone. Through baptism, 
We are all empowered by the gift of the Spirit to be intimately, intimately a part of each other's lives, to enter each other's lives, to understand each other's lives, to connect with each other's lives, to enter into, connect with, and understand the lives of people who are beyond these walls. And in doing this, by being this for each other, you will come to know more personally the very presence of God in your own life. So now, we come to the purpose of the great proclamation of the day of Pentecost. That great proclamation is that you, each and every one of you, you are the body of Christ, the church. As such, you, each and every one of you, have been given the Holy Spirit, both personally and communally. So I must break the incredible, outrageous news. As a Christian, you are in God's own to one, to all. 